Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week, for the first time in a long time, I have no long intro. I mean, I say that, but I'm sure this will go longer than planned, but I don't think I have much to say. I'm at a point where it's shoulder season. I'm still rehabbing my thumb, and I'm riding my indoor bike, and I'm generally confused with our country again. While I hate getting political, I don't understand how the fuck we can be going back on Roe vs. Wade. It almost makes me think back to when my wife asked me to get a vasectomy. I looked at her like she was crazy. While I listened to her opinion, I was like, there's no way anyone can tell me what to do with my body. I firmly believe that. I believe the same thing about abortion. And you know what? I'm not going to tell you what to believe, but my stance here is that we are fucking morons if we're going to go backwards on Roe vs. Wade, and it's a shame for every woman on the planet. And I believe that most anti-abortion people would change their mind if one of their loved ones was raped and impregnated, but that's an awful thing to even think about, so I'm not going to talk about that anymore. One thing I also don't understand is what a lot of the anti-abortion people do. It's crazy to me that they spend so much time outside of clinics persuading people against getting abortions. They spend a lot of time online trying to persuade people against getting abortions. What do these people do in life? Do they have jobs? And when I see anti-abortion people online or out in front of a clinic, I always think to myself, go back to your church and worry about yourself and what your loved ones are up to. Or worry about what your pastor is up to. And really, I don't know what just happened here. I told myself I didn't have much to say and I wasn't going to bring this polarizing issue up and go figure, that's exactly what I did. What's not polarizing is the fact that GoPro is the best POV cam ever built and it does so much more these days than just capture POV footage. I want to thank Davey over at GoPro for hooking me up with a camera, some accessories, and a sick waterproof backpack that will be the future home of a lot of 10 barrels when I'm out on my paddleboard. But that's enough talk from me. Sorry to the folks I've alienated, but you know everyone has an opinion and now you know mine. I'm also of the opinion that the legends of this industry need to have their stories told before they go away. And my guest this week, Marco Shapiro, is the godfather of modern ski photography according to Powder Magazine. He's responsible for creating a style of photography that has become the standard today in action sports, and he's shot with the best, from John Faulkner to Wayne Wong to Scott Schmidt to Glenn Plake and so many others. And what's different about this podcast is one of those other people that Marco was able to shoot with, Stanley Larson, is in the room for the interview, adding another level of chaos to the whole production. Combine that with Marco, who's got the amazingly fitting nickname Grumpy, and we have a fun podcast that is all over the place. Before we get into it, please review me wherever you listen to the podcast. It's easy to do, and it takes about a minute wherever you do it. And really, I don't ask much from you at all. So please submit a review for me, and if you don't, You can always make it up to me by following me on Instagram at The Powell Movement or telling your friends in real life or on social media to listen to the show. Finally, I want to thank my amazing sponsors for making this thing happen. They are Rollerblade, Elon Skis, Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Now, let's talk with Marco Shapiro. You are known as the godfather of free skiing photography, at least that's what Powder Magazine has called you. And one of your most famous shots is two of your good friends, Ace Cavalli and John Faulkner, and they're blasting through powder. It's an iconic shot, and I'm going to promote the podcast with that shot. But I think a lot of people don't know, and it's something that I recently heard, that John had a broken back for that shot. Is that true? Is there a backstory that no one knows about that one? A little backstory? No, 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 that's that's not true. Uh, John was over on uh, the Savalier side of Verbier, and it was a whiteout. He hit a road crashed and did his back. Was it that day when you were shooting he did his back? No, 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 not at all. Not at all. It was just a whiteout and all of a sudden he's banging on my door and he crashed out at my place for for weeks. And then that shot had nothing to do with his back injury? Nothing to do with it whatsoever. That's another story, which is a good one. All right. Well, why don't we share that story? Because I started it out with something that wasn't true at all. And I was given some secret information that is obviously wrong here. Wrong, totally wrong. So that's okay. What's the story behind the story? Okay, the, the, the story was, I'm now 50 years living in Verbier. But anyhow, that story, we got up one morning. It was a, it was a great snowfall. We went up to the uh, ski lift station of Atlas 1. We dropped down underneath. We skied across a little bit to where there was 
a road in the summertime and a wind lip. So I opened up my camera to change films. I popped the cap on the film to throw the roll of film in, and it was all my my pot. Yeah. So I dumped all the pot into the back of the camera, and oh no, this is <laughs> disaster. The pot was pretty hard to find in in the seventies. You guys no, just 80s, have like hash sorry, over there. Eighties, eighties. Right? It was yeah. all hash, and so uh, I sorted that out. I lost all that, put the film in, skied down a bit. And said, okay, I want you two guys to explode this windlip. Okay, so I, I got set up. They held hands until they hit the lip, and then they powered with their knees and just, just blasted the shit out of it. And that's the best photo period in powder magazines. I think it was 1984, 85 photo annual. That picture went all over the world. Posters, front covers, uh, Aka Skidor did a lithograph of it, and it's still being printed today. I sell that picture as wall art, one and a half meters, two meters by by 80 for people's walls, and it's just, it's insane how far that picture's gone. Well, that's another story that I'd gotten information about, and I actually was going to ask you about dumping weed into your camera later on in the podcast, but... We knocked that one out in the beginning. So your most famous shot ever almost was inspired by you throwing a bunch of weed in your camera and you're lucky you didn't break it. It was just dust, weed. You, know? <laughs> you just turn the camera over and blow it out a bit and throw a film in, where you go. All right. Well, your incredible career is all about being behind the lens, but your life and time start being born and raised in Toronto, I believe. That's correct. With Canadians, a lot of what you hear about, other than skiing, is hockey. Was there any hockey in your in your youth? Well, yeah, I used to play hockey on the street. Of course, I'm a Maple Leafs fan, but no, I didn't play hockey, um, league hockey. Let's uh, let's say. You grew up. I guess your high school was Hamilton. Was it in Hamilton? It was, was in it? Hamilton. Yeah, Westmount and, Secondary. And there's a famous movie called Young Blood, and I don't know if it's before your time or after your time, whatever. But did you ever see that movie and get inspired by Dean Young Blood? No idea. All right. So I'm striking out with a lot of these questions here, and that's just the beginning. The first camera you ever got, I believe that's from your grandfather at age seven. And when a seven-year-old gets a camera, it seems like one of those gifts where you get it and you push a button, and then that's it. And then you have nothing until you get the film developed. Is it something that's exciting for you when you're young? Or is it just something that your grandfather and you are going to bond over? Well, it's my grandfather gave it to me, and I, I shot my first roll of film, and it Ended at 12 pictures. I thought it would go on forever, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I sent I sent it in. The pictures came back. I, I don't really recall what, what the pictures were of, but it caught my fancy. It became my hobby. When I was studying in Toronto, I bought my first reflex camera, a Minolta SR1 with two lenses and a, and a light meter, you know, totally manual. So I had to learn about light and aperture and speed and focus. You know, I still manual focus today. So I always had a camera with me. I got to Verbier, and a friend of mine, uh, Pascal Bury, who uh, owns the Ferris of El Pizzeria, quite the institution in town, got me up. We went up to Lac de Vaux, took a couple of pictures. He was wearing jeans and a leather jacket, uh, and it was for OTA ski. This is the, the years of the compact ski. Okay. So this is like 74, I believe, from the research I've done, but we're getting way ahead of ourselves. It was more like, yeah, 74, 75. Yep. And the, the picture that they bought one from me, they paid me 250 Swiss francs, which was probably back then maybe four or $500. Dollar was uh, worth something back then. Right. And a pair of skis. And I said, whoa, whoa I like this. This is cool. You know, so I didn't have to table weight anymore or shovel snow or, you know, do ski bum jobs, washing dishes, which actually was my first job in Verbier. Dishwasher. Plongeur, they call it in French. <laughs> Sounds a lot more fancy than dishwasher. Yes. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves. So you got a camera when you're seven. Now we're already at OTA. So we're going to take it way back. And how do you get into skiing? Because that's got to be a passion of yours as well. I remember seeing... An ad in TV in the, I guess it was uh, early 60s, it was a beer ad, and don't ask me what beer it was, but there were all of a sudden there was these people skiing down a road, and I said, well, my brother and I said, look at that, That's, that looks cool. My parents had some hickories in the basement with these lace-up boots. Okay. 
So we went out in the backyard with our rubber boots, or sock boots, and went straight down on the little little hill behind the house. Eventually went down to the golf course with, you know, with the same gear, hickory skis, rubber boots, and straight lined on the hills. That's how skiing began for me. Went to the ski show in Toronto, looked at all this cool stuff, and uh, it just went from there. And then what's your local hill? My local hill is Verbier, Switzerland. What was your local hill when you were a kid? Shadok Golf Course. And there was nowhere near where you would go to like a local mountain to get lift service stuff? Yes. While I was in college and and then started working my first job uh, out of college, there was Collingwood Blue Mountain north of Toronto, up by Barrie. And so a bunch of my high school buddies, we got a condo up there, so it would be you know weekends getting pissed and going skiing. Didn't know how to ski, but you figured it out after a while. Right. So never took a lesson, but figured it out. Did it become a passion for you? Like a lot of the people I interview, they get Loves. bit by the bug right away. I love skiing. It was just wonderful. And had taking pictures become a passion for you as well? Because like I'm thinking that you're like a photo nerd and a ski nerd, and then those things all merge together. When I yes. say nerd, I don't mean them bad. I mean them in like... No, no, no. I understand. No, exa- exactly. It was my, my skiing. I had a decent camera. A single lens reflex, and Pascal got me up. We took these pictures, and one picture got bought for OTA Ski, and it just went from there. Eventually, I, I met John, and we got the chalet up in Clombam, which is this little alpage um, um, uh, above Verbier, and Team Clombam began. Ace showed up, and then from there, the pictures went to Powder Magazine, and then the whole world showed up. Yeah, it seemed like you had the pick of the litter when Team Columbia was going on. But we are still getting way ahead of ourselves because you want to get into the meat of everything really quickly, which is great. But I'm going to reel it back even more. And so you're in school and you're passionate about skiing and photography. And when you finish school, do you get a job in Canada? Or is it something where you're like, hey, I'm going to go straight over to Europe and I'm just going to follow this ski thing and just be a ski bum? Okay, my school education was tool and die designer. I got a job in an office furniture factory making metal office furniture. Sounds miserable. Yeah, it was miserable. It was horrible. Uh, One day, a Swiss kid came in, living with an aunt and uncle in the boonies. And him and I became friends. He came down to the city to live in uh, the flat that I was living in, because one of the guys in my flat got married. He stayed for a year. We used to go skiing on weekends up in Collingwood. And then he he went home, and I eventually followed. And is it one of those things where you're just going to go follow and do a few weeks over there and just check out what Switzerland has to offer? Or do you buy a one-way ticket, and it's like, Mom, Dad, I'll see you later. I'm going to check out Europe. How does that work? Yeah, my sister got married, and I I left three days later on a one-way ticket. What did your parents say to that? You were like, I'm buying a one-way ticket. I don't know when I'll be home. I don't remember what they said so long ago. Okay. (laughs) It's 50 years. Yeah. (laughs) But I would think there would be like a conversation like, hey, Marco, are you sure you want to buy a one-way ticket? We love you. You're our kid. Well, they didn't know I bought a one-way ticket for starters. And students were traveling to Europe at that time. It was cheap. You flew on Icelandic for a hundred bucks or something. Wow. Yeah, it was cheap. We're talking 1970. Okay. 1970-71 1970-71 was my first, my first winter. That's just incredible. For 100 bucks, you can go over there. I mean, it's all stuff that would never happen today. No college kid would say it's cheap to go over to Europe right now. It just seems ridiculously expensive. But it was easy to see the world back then? Well, it was then because the dollar when I arrived was 4 francs 27. A beer cost $1.50, a franc 50. It was cheap. And your know, rents were cheap. You know, 20 of us rented a chalet. Ski bum. And, you know, when you say cheap, I think of photography as well back then as being something that was a lot more expensive than it is today, given your gear is going to be expensive whenever you're buying it. But back then, if you shoot a roll of film, you got to go pay to get it developed. You don't know what's going to be on that film. I mean, especially when you're beginning, you don't know if you're getting great shots or not until you figure out the light and everything that you need to learn and be a great photographer. So are you learning all the aspects of developing the film yourself and trying to keep it as cheap as possible with having photography as a passion? Well, I shot black and white in Toronto when I was studying, and I had a little lab so I could process my film. and That's why I started learning about processing and taking pictures with the light using a light meter, etc. And is that all stuff that nobody does today because they have such high-tech cameras? Well, exactly. Today, 
taking a picture's idiot proof. Yeah. You know, there's thousand kids out there running around taking ski pictures, snowboard pictures, and sport pictures. Because the camera does everything. And so the photographers of your era, when you started, I mean, I don't want to say you're better photographers, but you have a lot more knowledge. And being that you have a lot more knowledge, if everything breaks and you had to go to an old school camera, like you could still take the same great photo. I could do it. And the new guys, they wouldn't know what the hell was going on. And I still have my couple of my old cameras. If I ever had to fall back, I, I would. But I do like my uh, Nikon D850. It's a lovely camera. Okay. So you were doing a lot of the developing and learning all the chemicals and all of that yourself. And then when you head over to Switzerland, is it like you get a place and you get some shit job washing dishes or being a plonger or whatever they call it? And then do you set up a photo studio in your little place? Because it sounds like when you say Team Colombian, that was a bunch of guys that lived maybe 10 or 15 minute, I don't know if it's a walk or a drive away. And then you, you were always in the city. So it sounds like that was kind of where like all the hippie ski bums lived and you stayed where all the reputable people were. Well, I stayed downtown to receive people. When the whole world started showing up, it was the time of freestyle. Freestyle before it went FIS, F-I-S. Yeah. Okay. Well, before it went F-I-S. So I used to go to all the competitions on weekends in the Euro Cup. The first competition, of course, was uh, in Chile Alto and Gervinia, where I started meeting the world's best, the Americans and the Europeans. Okay, and then that summer, I went to Henri Otier, Manfred Kastner's ski camp, freestyle camp in Teen. Okay. Where they had a water jump, and in the mornings, we'd go up on the glacier and do ballet, and I, I met all these, these people there. This is before Klomban, and before I met John and Ace. Okay. And, the, and the rest of the gang. So this is like 70, 71, like your first year or two out there? No, actually, that competition was 75. I'd already been into it. So eventually, you move yourself over to Verbier, because that's what we're kind of leading up to, yes. to really start life over in Europe. And you have nothing going on for you in Verbier. You know one dude who tells you that you need to be over there. And then you make the trip. When you get there, is it like, you have to figure out all this shit on your own, or is your buddy helping you out, find a place to stay and learn the language and all this stuff that you don't know? Well, I got to Europe, I got to Zurich, saw my friend, and then I went up to Munich to the Oktoberfest, came back down to Switzerland, it was already uh, October. And I got into Switzerland, found out in Lausanne there was this place called the Club Vagabond. Okay, so I went up there and hung out up there for, for a while, went down, picked grapes, did the vendage, picked grapes, went back up there, and a couple of, couple of guys said, oh, we just been over to this place called Verbier, and we rented a chalet. Who wants to join in? You know, my hand went up immediately. Yeah, I'll stay the winter. So I went up and bought some gear. And I didn't have ski gear with me, so I had to go buy everything. You know, the dollar was 427 so I was, I was kind of rich. Right. Because I sold my car, I sold my stereo, sold everything in Canada. You know, I had 10 grand in my pocket. We went over there, and there were more ski bums that winter than you can possibly imagine. For me, it was the greatest eye-opener. Sex and drugs and rock and roll. It was awesome. All right there with skiing. Yeah, all with, all with the skiing. The mountain was open, and it was fantastic. Halfway through the winter, I got a bit tired of my species, and I made a friend, a Swiss friend, called Francis Sultani, and, of course, Pascal Bury from the Fair Chevelle, and I started hanging out with them, you know, see how things were done the Swiss way. And I started picking up French, and by, you know, by now I, I speak French pretty, pretty well. And it just went from there. My friend Francis, there was this company, in, in uh, a hotel company, who bought a bar in Verbier, and Francis took it over as the manager, and he asked me if I wanted to stay. So I stayed the summer. And saw Verbier in the summertime, had a great time, but it worked, worked my ass off as a bartender and table waiter. That went for a few years until I could start making a living taking pictures. Now it's time for my first sponsor break, and the Ten Barrel Brewery, based out of Bend, Oregon, has been supporting this show for five years, and they support so much more in action sports. Between a world-class team of athletes and creating standalone movie projects and events, Ten Barrel really puts their money where their mouth is. And on top of that, they brew the best beer in the country. I'm a big fan of their Hazy IPA Profuse Juice and their new Pilsner, but all of their beers are fantastic and worth a taste from you. 
So next time you're at the store, please pick up a six-pack of 10 Barrel to find out what I'm talking about. For more about the beers, the events, and the athletes, head on over to 10barrel.com. My next sponsor is Stanley, and they have also been supporting the show forever. And you know Stanley. They're the brand famous for making that iconic green bottle that keeps coffee hotter and water colder than anyone else. Well, Stanley still makes that iconic bottle, but they also have everything you could possibly need for your camping adventure this summer. And I'm going to get you the best deal possible out there on all Stanley products. What you need to do to get 30% off all of your Stanley order is head on over to Stanley1913.com. Pick out all the items you need and then some. I highly recommend the pint glasses and the water bottles. And when you check out, enter the code DRINKFAST. That's all lowercase and all one word and you will save that 30%. My final sponsor this round is Rollerblade. And if you're a skier, your ski legs should be in great shape right now. And ski muscles are the hardest to build. The only way i found to keep them year-round and eliminate getting back into shape once the snow starts falling again is through inline skating. And Rollerblade not only invented the sport, they make the best products on the planet. On top of that, their award-winning Skate to Ski program in the App Store is all you need to keep those ski legs strong. So to find out more about the app, just head on over to the App Store, search for Skate to Ski, and download the app. Or head on over to Rollerblade.com to find out all about their amazing products. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. And that all started, like you said, with Pascal. And he's like the first person you meet in Verbier, which is pretty cool that he gets you a yes. job as well. But that's in 74 when he gets you the job. And between that, you've done all kinds of crazy odd jobs. You were a DJ. You were washing dishes. You're just doing anything you could to kind of make ends meet over there and be the ski bum that you were. And in the terms of the ski industry at that point, the hot dog movement has started over in the U.S. Has it made its way over to Europe yet? Like, are you starting to see stuff trickle in over there? Well, it had because I went to this competition, a World Cup competition in Cervinia, Italy. That's the backside of the Matterhorn. Okay. Servan. Okay. And then the aerials and the ballet and all the Americans and all the Europeans. And I was watching how they all hated each other. It was hilarious. It was such an eye-opener. Such an eye-opener. So I got hooked on freestyle. And speaking of everybody hating each other, being that you're Canadian, where do you fit into that mix? Are you welcomed by everyone? Well, I was already living in Europe. So when I got to this competition, of course, I was sitting with my own species, speaking English. Right. And the Europeans started, started coming around, coming over is when I met Manfred Kastner and Henri Otier. Manfred Kastner being Austrian, Otier being French. And it came up that this uh, summer camps, freestyle camp they had in Teen. So I went. I went over. This was 75. I went over that summer, hung out the whole summer, and started taking pictures of the water jump and uh, the practice jump up on the glacier with uh, hay banks for crash pads and ballet, and it was great. So I, I, met, I met all the Europeans, and then so certain North Americans who, who were there, like Stephanie Sloan, people like that. Had you already met John Faulkner in Verbier? Uh, it was probably around then that right I had met, met John, because I know the second time, I, the second summer I went to teen, John came with me. Yeah, because that sounds like he went to that camp as well, because yeah, he, he wanted to learn all the flips and all the yeah, tricks yeah. to be able to shoot better with you. Yeah, he was on the Aussie freestyle team. Okay, so that makes sense. So you meet John. He becomes like your wingman for life, it seems like. But you guys become fast friends in Verbier. You're in town. He's up in Clambon. And that's like a 15 minutes away. Stanley, am I saying it wrong? No, you're you got, right. You're you guys right. guys moved up there together. No, 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 no. It was in the summertime. John and I yeah. were out wandering around the woods. Right. Okay, and we, we, we came by through Clamban, yeah. stopped at the chalet, and the, the owner was standing on the balcony. Yeah. And so we, with our, the French that we knew, we started speaking with him. And then John asked him if he'd like to rent the place. And the guy scratched his head and he had not much of an idea about that. And he said, well, okay. So John rented the chalet and it became uh, Clamban headquarters. And that was Ballet Uva? Chalet Ballet Uva. Okay. And so I think the year before Ballet Uva, is when Stanley Larson, who happens to be sitting with us right now, Stanley, one of the K2 athletes back in the day who traveled the world just promoting skiing all over the world before people were promoting it all over the world, at least the freestyle aspect of skiing. So Stanley's here. 
So K2 comes over with Dick Barrymore in 1975. They're filming for Assignment K2. And it's Stanley, it's Wong, it's Garrison, it's Brooksbank, it's Clendenin. And they're ushering in a new kind of skiing. And what were those dudes like when you first met that whole K2 crew and Dick Barrymore? What was that like for you? Because I'm sure Barrymore is a hero to you, I would think. Absolutely. I was in awe, absolute awe when these guys showed up. It was fantastic. And I hung out the whole time with them, helped them build the jump. And, uh, you know, what, what more can I say? I can say a lot. Stanley, jump on in there. First, the 70s. What a weekend. The whole decade, right? And Marcos, Marcos got so many stories that there's that whole chronological thing. So, if I remember, first time I came to Europe was 1972-73. You were working at the farm club. Yeah, I was the DJ at the farm club. At the club. DJ up in this little thing. And, and I was there. Scott Brooksbank and Greg Smith, Corky Fowler were doing the Marlboro <laughs> Ski Show things. First freestyle came to Europe ever, period. That was it, right? Nobody else had come at that point. So the first guy you really met in the hot dog era of freestyle was Brooksbank and I, if you think about it. And you were working up there, and we were like, dude, you speak English. You're a fun guy, you know. He's not Marco Shapiro. No, he's just he's this just little dark guy. guy up in there with his full-up beard and full hair. And we somehow found out you spoke English. <laughs> and we asked you for some hash or something. If you could get us something, I can't remember. But we had this, you know, full-up choreographed ski show with a you know, massive media thing, live television. And we asked, what do you like to do? You're, you're, you're a ski bum now, but what do you want to do? And it was to be a photographer. And at that point, it was like, cool, you ought to come up to the jump. Uh, we're going to be doing this stuff all week and hang out and do your, sh do your stuff and we'll help you out. And there was like 40 photographers from Perry Match to every magazine, everything. But this was our guy. And I remember well that, you know, we have pictures, if you remember, and you're up there building the jumps, but it's like, hey, here's the thing called the turkey pit. Get there. You'll get these pictures. And kind of that was how a lot of that era. And Pascal was right in there, too. Pascal Pizzeria, he loved American stuff. And right next to him was the ski shop that was in ski service. Ski service, which was run by two Americans. And they could only sell like American products because none of the European would go violate their European sovereignty with the other ski shops. So they sold these skis, Bademan, Scott, Smith, all that K2. stuff. K2. Get K2. Hansen. And so then, yeah, and Hanson. But they, Spademan. Yeah. And so there was this great little posse that really embraced the hot dog era in Verbier at that time. And this, you got to remember, was... But the Moran family, they had two lifts, and it was pasture land. There was no verbier at that time, really. You know, there was a runette and a few other things, but compared to today, I mean, this was still just a typical European ski. No, area. there were there were there were good uh, lifts. Yeah, it was, well, that's why it was successful. But I mean, compared to how it grew and expanded, oh, yeah, it's, yeah, that's it's, for sure. It's crazy. But back then, it was like kind of really a, a family resort, but very successful. And Stanley, on the non-family side, you had told me back in the day that when you were traveling around, you were on like a Marlboro airplane and it's sponsored by like booze and you guys are just partying your faces off. And that's what that was all about back then. That's when we met. And Verbier was one of the first places we went to and through the Middle East and, and Japan. And we were in 45 ski areas in like 95 days or something. But what was interesting, that was my first year. And then the next year came over with Clendenin and Mike Lund. And I think that's the year came back with Dick Barrymore to make Assignment K2, which would have been the 74-75 season. And Dick said, hey, you've been all over. Where should we go in Europe? What places? Because we knew we were going to end up in La Cialto. Trevinia. Trevinia for the event at the Chilio Alto, Chilio Alto it's place. So Barry, I said, hey, Dick, man, Verbier, it's the shit. That's where we got to go. So the Marco Shapiro K2 relationship starts with assignment K2, kind of. 
No, that started with John Faulkner on the K2 summer exhibition show. Okay. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, 72, 73. Okay, well. And then John came the next year and lived in Verbier. Yeah, my, my relationship with K2 didn't start then. Okay, even though even though Barrymore oh, gave me a pair of skis. That was, was in 75. Yeah, totally It, it wasn't until Faulkner started actually working with K2 Switzerland. So, in theory, you introduce the Marco Shapiro to K2 for the first time. Not a, The relationship hadn't started yet, but when you flew over and you were doing those demos, that was kind of like an introduction to K2 for you. And then eventually, you have a full-on relationship with K2, like, Per Headland lives like in town, so you know him. Per K- Headland. Per, yeah. And so he runs all of K2 in Europe, and he's in Verbier, so you know him. So you're going to have an amazing relationship with K2. But when Stanley and those dudes come out, that was your first introduction to like maybe the dirtbag athletes of K2 at that time. Not that you're a dirtbag, Stanley, but you are. Yeah, that's But it wasn't sort, all sort K2. Right. I skied for K2. Other people had other sponsors, but I was a K2 guy on that team. But Faulkner came. When Barrymore, when we came back to shoot Assignment K2, John was in the thick of it. He was skiing with you guys, it sounds like. And then when you guys left, he, he went to Teen to learn those tricks, he said, because well, he wanted to ski for Marco, and he wanted to get those tricks down. He's like, I went and skied with all those dudes at Assignment K2. My mind was fucking blown, and I went to camp in Teen, and I came back with Marco, and I was like, two I things, on fire. Two things happened. One, got John a job schlepping for Barrymore carrying tripod and stuff when we shot. Okay. And the other great thing was Mark shot at that time when we were filming the shot of Dick Barrymore, the iconic shot of him skiing. The one that's on the cover of his book. No. That no, happened during Assignment K2. wrong. That was during Assignment no, K2. No, it's when Barrymore came over to shoot for Yves Bessas for La Nuit de la Glisse. What year was that? That was, uh, we're moving into the 80s. All right, I feel like we're, we're grumpy old men right now in the movie. We're going to pull Stanley out of the interview. So let's see how I'm going to tie this back together. So Faulkner goes to a ski camp in teen. He's going to learn all the tricks of the era. He's going to come back to Verbier with you, and he's going to shoot for you, and he's going to have a lot more tricks in his bag. At that point, John gets hooked up by K2. I think that's when Per Hedlin hooks him up. He's got an apartment in Verbier. He takes care of John. Are you kind of put on the K2 program too? Does Per kind of give you skis and say, hey, Marco, whatever you need, I got you? It sort of happened like that. Things okay. happened as they happened, one thing at a time. Nothing was, like, say, ordained or anything. It just happened as things happened. It's like Team Klomban. It, it just happened as things happened. We became popular because of Powder Magazine. Back then, all the European magazines were FIS. I didn't want to know about powder snow. It was just ski racing, ski racing, which I had absolutely no interest in. Right. It was organized on a course, you know, like tennis or football or any, any of these other sports. But I think with John and then Ace showed up, it was free ride or powder snow skiing, as we called it back then. Free ride, as it called today. Yes. And these pictures. These pictures, the tour operators bought these pictures like crazy. The British, the French, the Italian, and the German tour operators, they were constantly buying powder snow pictures. A beautiful picture of a guy or a a, a woman skiing towards me, blue sky, white snow, big smile, you know, pair of sunnies. No, No goggles, no helmets, none of that. Right. No backpacks. We eventually got beacons, but those pictures just went nuts. You guys are selling vacations. You're selling a lifestyle to the world. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, K2 got pictures. We had a variety of boots we worked with at the time. Hanson, Dale Boots, Reikley, and, and then we got hooked up with Scarpa. And so it's been Scarpa forever. But in 1975, it's not like you're a pro skier or even a no. pro photographer. You're like a worker who's got this photography habit that habit. you've had for a long time. Exactly. And when you start taking pictures of dudes in the big mountains, because like you say, you're not on some race course. You guys are looking for shit that no one else is going to take photos of. That's exactly. like what you love to do. And you're doing it with a 40-pound backpack on. Sorry, I'm metric. 10 what? kilos. 10 kilos in your backpack. Uh, times 2.2. What's your worst crash with a 10-kilo backpack on? My worst crash was trying to carry this stuff on Telemark skis. 
I undid the boots because it was on a, a photo shoot for a sports shop. It's always like Hollywood, hurry up and wait. Yep. Okay? So it was all done, and I forgot to do the boots up. I took off, did one turn, ass over tit, crashed. It hit my head on the, the ski tip. Right. And it, it kind of hurt. But the worst crashes were me. One of my ladies, Nikki Jane Oakshot, came off this rock, cut my head open, hit me with the edge of a ski, cut just... my head open, you know, 12 stitches. <laughs> Just coming way too close? Yeah, coming way too close. I just ducked out of the way. Saw her coming, took the picture, and ducked and zing over the top of my head. Bled like a pig. <laughs> and that's just part of the game for a photographer. That's part of the game. The, the, the second one was working with Nicola Halewood, the guys from the Verbier Extreme. Now, this is before the Verbier Extreme. And they were on snowboards. And uh, one one of the guys hit me on the side, broke my arm. So... Ski photography, snowboard photography, winter sport photography can be dangerous for the photographer. Because I know Pierre Ponce, he got killed in an avalanche, or uh, uh, I think he, it was an avalanche, or he fell on a crevasse, got killed. He was photographing over in Chamonix. Well, I mean, that's the thing is, all these pro skiers that you're shooting, they are supremely talented, and they can take the gnarliest lines down this terrain that's crazy, but you still have to get down it too, and you have to be a great skier as well. I'm a good skier, not a great skier. Well, they're the best. I bet you you're, you're pretty damn good at this point. 50 years carrying a 40-pound backpack, chasing the best skiers in the world. You've got to be, I would think, a great skier. Great skiers make mistakes, too. I'm sure shit happens every once in a while. But it's crazy that, you know, you need to be where Scott Schmidt is. And you've got to be able to ski, not like Scott, but you've got to be able to get down and live through it. And, yes. yeah, I can see that you're going to lose some people. The next big thing that happens in your life is Ace coming out. I think Ace went to Chamonix first in 78. Chamonix wasn't really his thing. And then he goes straight to Verbier. And are you the first person he meets in Verbier? That's what he told me. So much went on in my life. I've met so many people. I just cannot remember who, when, where, and, and, and how. And they have to tell me. So this is what Ace told me. I was the first person. I can't remember if I was. I think he came into the Ferris Chevelle, the pizzeria, and uh, I bought him a beer, got him a place to live and a, and a job. <laughs> <laughs> so he's forever indebted to you. And then I started knowing everybody. You know, even the cops were on my side. <laughs> And with Ace, it's like you, John, and Ace, are you pretty much like a threesome traveling everywhere in the mountains together, maybe a couple times a week and just banging out photos as often every as you can? Time, every time it snowed. Okay. Yeah, we were up there. And that, that's your thing. So when you say you shoot powder, it's like it has to snow for you to go and bring your camera gear? Yes, but at, at the time, there's, there's a line called Krebly on the front of Verbier, which is a, a, a big, wide bowl. Okay. And then it snowed regularly. It stayed cold, and we could ski in there for three, four days before we'd move on into the back country. You know, today it's it's all burned out in about an hour. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, you know, free ride took off. Mm -hmm. And so you get a bunch of shots with John and Ace published. I know Ace said he had a spread and powder that was like a life-changing for him that you got published that first season. And before John moved into Belle Uva, he was in a different place, and I guess there was a week where they used to rent these big mansion like chalets out to people, and like the English and other people would come and rent these places Tour out. Tour operators. Yeah, and one week someone didn't show up, and you guys got to have the house to yourself, like a run of this mansion to yourselves. And the story I heard was like, I should ask you about the screamer. And does that mean anything to you when I ask you about the screamer? I see a smile on your face. <laughs> I met the Swiss German girl, <laughs> and she came and lived with me for the winter. Okay. And she was a screamer. She was just right into it, <laughs> right into it. Yeah, young Swiss German. She was right into it. So it was a wonderful winter. It's time for sponsor break number two. And while ski season is winding down, I can't thank Elon Skis enough for the amazing product this year. My ripsticks have made me a better skier, and I haven't had as much fun on skis since I made the switch to Elon. There's something to be said about the quality of the build. And next time you head to your local ski shop, examine the skis on the wall and then look at the Elans. You can see the difference in the build and the quality of the build. And when you get them on snow, well, they ski that much better than the other products on the wall. I highly encourage everyone to demo a pair of Elan 
as I know once you try them, you will understand the cult-like following that the brand has been building the past few years. To find out more about the skis, head on over to elanskis.com. My final sponsor is Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. Peter Glenn is your one-stop shop for all things winter. But now that spring is here and summer is right around the corner, Peter Glenn has all you need for camping, hiking, wakeboarding, inline skating, and more. They have all the brands, all the products, and all the deals. But if you find a better deal from a reputable retailer, Peter Glenn will price match it. So do me a favor. Before you buy something from someone else, check out Peter Glenn's pricing too. Usually it's better, and if they aren't, like I said, they will price match. And know that Peter Glenn isn't the typical industry giant looking to expand and take over. They are here to serve you like they have for over 70 years. To find out more about the brands and the products, head on over to peterglenn.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Well, while I'm on the topic of women, it sounds like you used to fall in love with different models all the time, and it didn't always work out well for you. Like sometimes you would get beat up because the model would want to go with you and the boyfriend would be pretty pissed off. Any truth to that? Uh, yes. One instance. I think I have a photo of the instance, but you're wearing sunglasses so you can't see the two black eyes. Yeah, it was Bruce Benedict came over with a plaque and, and hat trip to do some mogul film. Uh, what was it called? Um, Fistful. Fistful of moguls okay. or, or something. Just a minute. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. I know it was Benedict. I just, I'd just i just been beaten up by an irate husband the <laughs> night before, so I had two black eyes. <laughs> yeah, my sonny's, my varney's on. Benedict was there filming. What's his first movie? Um, no, not not flop. It was it was Blizzard of Oz. He was over in Verbier filming Blizzard of Oz, and so he interviewed John and I for the film. There's a postage stamp picture of the two of us being interviewed while the film is running, and I'm, you know, I got my sonny's on covering up two black eyes. That's pretty funny. So while that happens, and you can piss off husbands and things like that. One thing that's also known about you is that you're a stickler. Like, when you say we're going to be there at 9 tomorrow morning or we're going to be there at 7 tomorrow morning, you're going to be there at 6.45. Those motherfuckers better be there at 7. And if they're not, they, they might be off behind. the list. Yeah. Did that happen a lot where you'd have an athlete that you'd want to shoot because you know of their talent, but they just weren't on time and they didn't fit your program and you're like, you're off the list? It was only John. Really? <laughs> yeah. John will be late for his own funeral. <laughs> I but he swear. never faced the wrath of, well, he probably faced the wrath, but you kept shooting with him. Oh, you know, he was my best mate. Yeah. But you know the actual story about John and I? I don't know. This is one of the greatest stories of, ever. That was my question. Our there. fathers were in the RAF during the war. My father flew a bomber. His father flew a Spitfire. Australian? They both, they, um, Australian, Canadian. They both got shot down, and they both spent the war in a POW camp together. We found out this one night in a, in a chalet that John was living in before Bella Luva. That's the craziest shit I've ever heard. I called my father. He said, oh, yeah, Jumbo Faulkner. Yeah, I know him. And I, <laughs> he called his father, Sam Shapiro. Oh, yeah, yeah, we were in the same camp together. So our relationship goes back to that point. That is so insane. I didn't even know Australia or Canada had planes. It was well, in the for RAF. The Queen, for the, for the, the RAF, the Royal Air Force. They were volunteers. They came to England to fight the Germans. Yeah. One of them, when the plane went down, I can't remember, had burned. John. John's father. John Spitfire and, was, uh, was on fire before he got out and bailed out. And his father took care of him. That is so incredible. They were in the same camp. Uh, yeah, my father you, took care of him. Is that what John said? Yeah, one of you two said that, you know, he, no, they I were, know him. No, and, they they were in the same camp, so camp. they knew each other. You know, four and years, they were in a camp. Four years, yeah. And he was, he, you know, helped them as they became friends. Like, dude, you let me fix your Band-Aid or, you know, whatever. But That could be true. I'm not familiar with that. But it's an incredible story. Yeah. And it's so weird that you guys would connect again the next generation. Yeah, yeah mind blown. It's It's quite incredible. We'll bring up John again because the next year, I guess you guys are out foraging for mushrooms or something, and John runs into this landowner who's like, I've got this place, I want you to rent it. And it doesn't sound like it was in the most pristine condition to move into. Was it like a moldy, kind of decrepit kind oh, of place? Oh, no, no. It was, uh, it was the Swiss look after their property. They don't let it fall apart. Okay. But it was rustic. 
It was rustic. It had a heater downstairs. It had a shower upstairs and uh, what was it one, two, three, three fair sized bedrooms and, and a good kitchen. It was rustic. Let's say it was old. And so this is the big year because this is 7980. And I think this is the year where you're able to quit all your DJing and dishwashing and everything like yeah. that. You're finally a pro photographer in that season. Yeah, making a living. Yeah, and that's got to be a huge relief and turning point for you. It's yeah, like, it holy was. shit, I've done something here and the people want me to shoot. Like, you've become important in the ski industry because no one can shoot photos like you, right? I have a couple of mates, Hank DeVree, Wade McCoy. Yep. Felix St. Clair Renard, who, who came up slightly behind me, but same generation. And we've all become friends. They all lived where they lived and, and shot pictures. Powder Magazine was not just me. Even though Neil Stebbins, when I met him the first time, when I came over to North America, he said we couldn't wait to get your packet of pictures. Because people expected amazing stuff from you based on what they had seen, because you knew how to look at the light and maybe read the light read and the how light. it worked with the snow yes. better than anybody else could. And that's why, I mean, when you look at your photos, it's really how the snow is exploding and every single one of them is its own story within itself. And is that something that like you take pride in when you take photos? Absolutely. Like... I created a style that's followed today. Yeah. Yeah. And so... At one point, Mike Hattrip comes to town with Moore and Miller and a crew. He stays with you guys for about a month. And was that normal for you guys to have an athlete come out and just stay? Hey, I'm going to shoot with Marco and I'm going to live in Faulkner's house. And that's just how it's going to be. Yeah. yeah. Like Hattrip, I met Schmidt in Australia on a Warren Miller shoot. And he came the following winter with a couple of um, flea bags who were pawning themselves off as ski riders. And then Schmidt stayed, and he stayed for quite a while. It was just fabulous having these people come and stay. And when you look at, like, the guys that stayed, so you have, let's say, Hatchup, for instance. He's staying. You guys are going to do a trip on the Hot Room. He doesn't know shit about pins or anything like that. You know, he's Mike Hatchup at that point, a dude who just likes to get rad, I think. You guys teach him everything he knows about, not everything he knows, but taking him ski touring, that's you guys for the first time. He hasn't done that before he goes and visits you guys. Uh, sorry, I don't recall that. If true. John says that, then it's true. Yes. John says that Hatchup knew nothing, and you guys taught him everything about that on the trip. And I believe, I think I've talked to Hatchup about it as well. And he said the same thing, but you don't remember why? Because you maybe weren't at the Klombin house. You were just taking pictures when you guys were out doing shit. Well, yeah, I was doing a little bit of touring as well. I mean, touring was quite the thing in Europe. It, it hadn't taken off in North America. Yet. Right. So there was no mountaineering to Hatchup's life at that point till he came and saw Tilly you guys. Till he came to, to Europe and, and stayed with us. And then, of course, with K2, he became the uh, Telemar ski touring expert. I was thinking if it weren't for you, which you don't remember, and Faulkner taking Hatchup out and showing him the ways, K2 Telly may have never existed. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like you planted a seed and instilled a passion in Hatchup. I'll agree with that. So that's a pretty neat thing to do. And, you know, another crew that comes over, we had talked about the Blizzard crew came over, Plake was there, and you didn't want to shoot with Plake when he came over. It sounded like he was still drinking then, he was kind of an asshole, and he was like your typical dirtbag skier, and you wanted nothing to do with him. Would that be fair to say? Um, I, I, no, I, I, maybe initially, but we became really good friends pretty much immediately after that. There's plenty of areas where you're quoted as saying that. Who's quoting me on this? Magazines and publications over the years. What? I was just saying that you did not want anything to do with Plake at first. And then he showed a work ethic. Like, he missed some tram that you guys took, and he hiked it up himself. He had to do it at night to shoot with you guys the next morning. And I guess you might have seen the work ethic within Plake, and you were like, holy shit, this guy isn't just a total no, asshole. He works no, hard. No, 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 no. That's no, the data I'm getting, but I'm asking no, you. No, no. I've, I've been working with Plake way before that. Plake was a, just a fantastic skier with his mohawk, and, and people just love these pictures. As far as that climbing up to the top of the Momfor, that was in the summertime on a full moon party we used to have on the top of the Momfor which is uh, Verbier's highest peak, okay? He actually drove up. He, there was a road that went all the way to the Jean Siem, which is the main station there, 
and he, he booted up. There's John, Ace, me, and like like 12 other people on top, you know, waiting for the moon to come up. And we hear this voice and look down there. There's plate crawling up the face. Well, you had also said that people loved the plague photos, but in the U.S., I read that people hated the photos because they were too punk for the U.S. market, and they had to be run in Europe first, and they were cooler in Europe than they were in the U.S. Well, Europe has a different attitude towards all that than the redneck attitude in, in North <laughs> America. I mean, Plake, he's awesome, and at his age now, he's still doing it. Yeah, oh, I mean, I love the guy. But, I mean, he was a different person when you met him at first yeah, because yeah. he was partying and he was, like, on the lam. He had gotten busted for 40 pounds of mushrooms. And he was like, I'm going to Europe and I'm not coming back into the U.S. And he eventually came back because of Blizzard of Oz and Blizzard of Oz blew up. But he ended up doing a year in jail, like, broken up until a couple different terms. I'm not sure he went to jail. I think it was public service he had to do for a year. Well, I podcasted with him five times and I will quote him that he did time in jail. Him and Palmer. But separate. Palmer was with him when he was pulled over on that. But Palmer actually said that he was just driving by and stopping by to see this buddy on the side of the road. So Palmer didn't get in trouble on that one. But Plake sure did. And he was able to, you know, eventually yeah, he was ski a his way out of it. Yeah, he was. He was a fugitive in, in, in Chamonix. So when Schmidt comes over to Verbier, you guys all know about Schmidt already. You've already met him, I think, in New Zealand. And then... The other guys have all seen him in Powder Magazine because I think there was a feature on him in Powder, and at least that's what John said, so I'm pretty sure there was a feature on him in Powder, and everybody knew about him. But did he look at the mountain? Because he came out and stayed with you guys a little bit for like a month and yeah, shot with you a yeah, bunch. Yeah. Did he look at the mountain differently than almost anybody at that point? Because he kind of ushered in a new era of skiing, I feel like, in North America, at least to me. But I'm younger and I wasn't there living it. But in Europe, did he usher in a new view of the mountain there? It was big air jumping. You know, hucking his meat off cliffs. There's a cross at the top of, of the Montfort. And there's a spot off the back where he said, hey, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to huck this. This is when Ace started taking pictures. I got Ace sorted out with, I think it was an F2 or an F3. You bought him a camera and you mentored him. He went to South Africa the summer before. Took lots of fantastic. I said, the, the ski modeling, forget it, man. You're going to be a photographer now. And so him and I both double shot Schmidt hucking his meat off this cliff. And he showed John the style of how to, how to huck. You know, tuck and your arms with your sticks straight out. Point at your landing. So John had a go at it. And I got great pictures of both of them. Berghaus used the one of John. Powder Magazine used the ones that Ace and I were taking. It was fantastic. So. Schmidt brought in a new era of skiing. And it sounds like Scott was the gentleman ski bum, where I've spoken with him before and he's kind of quiet. He just didn't seem yeah. too outgoing towards me. His skiing spoke for itself, so yeah. you really didn't have to say anything to me ever. But when I talked to John, it sounded like Scott came and he partied. Like he would throw down at night and then be up first thing in the morning shooting with you. But like where I think he's a quiet guy, that was just my perception because he doesn't know me and he wasn't open with me. But he was like a, a fun, good times guy. Yeah, he was. Schmidt was the last man standing. Really? And the last man out of bed. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, the last man out of bed in the morning. I guess when you're as talented as him, there's some exceptions made. It's like, we can wait a little bit for Scott. Or Yeah, well, it was his metabolism okay, that yeah. allowed him to do this. Yeah, he was a good guy. I really liked him. It was, it was fun having him up there. And then other things that were fun there, it sounds like while you weren't like the biggest party party guy, like you weren't going to get drunk till four in the morning because you were going to be the first guy up and making sure that you were going to be working. That was just how it was going to be. But there were these things that were slideshow parties. And that was like the big thing that you guys did to party and throw down. Yeah. What was a slideshow party all about? So slideshow party, we'd go out and do a shoot. By this time, I'd be shooting slides, you know, Kodak. If it started with uh, Ektachrome 2. And then I liked the colors better with the Kodachrome and then the Kodachrome Pro. And it came with mailers. I'd shoot it, send it down to Lausanne, get it processed. I'd drive down, pick it up, come back, sort it out, put a carousel together, go up to John's, and all, all the models would come. We'd have a great big dinner and do a slideshow so we could see what was new, all the new slides. Then I'd package them up and ship them off to the tour operators powder magazine and 
I think by, by then some of the Euro magazines started picking up on free ride. This is in the 80s already, pushing in the, into the mid-80s. Okay. And we could talk about photography for the rest of the night. Forever. But, yeah, but we're not going to because we just don't have enough time. But there's a few more things I want to talk about before I get into my final segment, which Stanley's going to help me with. We call it inappropriate questions. I hope you don't know about it, but you might. But first, when you were a photographer back in the day, I mean, you're a photographer now as well. But was there good money to be made? I mean, it seemed like there were so few of you that were great at your craft. Were you guys on a pedestal and making some real, real money? Yes, we were making some real coin, and uh, and I always shared the wealth. Oh, you were the only guy that seemed to, I mean, there might have been others. But from anybody I talked to that shot with you, you would pay your models, which is unheard of in the industry today. People work with a photographer to get a photo, to get published, to tell their sponsors, hey, I was published. Can you pay me more? But back then, you paid your dudes right away. Like John was getting paid from you. Ace was getting paid from you. This is before the industry asked me to work with pro riders. Okay. I had a gang, a gang of people, men and women, had lots of girls working with me. Not for me. Nobody worked for me. They all worked with me. Okay, so they were regulars. Every time it snowed, we got together, went up the mountain, usually maximum four, four at a time. Yep. At least uh, one or two girls. There was always always a female in in the crew, the shooting crew. They're popular. Tour operators loved it when it was a girl with big hair and big smile and good skiers and good looking and snow flying. Right. Yeah, it was a big seller. You'd go to ISPO. They, they were loving these pictures. And so was that how you would get your money is not just from tour operators, but then you go to ISPO, ISPO and then you to the pimp industry. yourself to the yeah, industry? shooting ski fashion. You know, then, then it was skiing. A little, little later on, it became snowboarding when I started working for Quicksilver, let's say. Then it was snowboarding. Did you do a lot of snowboard shooting? Did a lot of snowboard shooting. Well, I've, I've worked for the beginnings of the border cross. Then I was working for Swatch and Siemens and Nokia, okay, and they they were paying me good money to shoot the border cross. It's a different time, but in the 80s, can you make like a hundred grand shooting photos or a couple hundred grand shooting photos? I was not a very good businessman. That was my big downfall. All artists aren't. Instead of driving a Subaru, I should be driving an Audi. <laughs> Stanley's driving a nice car. <laughs> yeah, but he's a better businessman than I am. <laughs> and plus, film film pays a lot more than photography. But, but yeah, I did really, really well. That's amazing. And then how many days of your life are you spending on the road in 1984? Are you on the road 200 days a year? Oh, well, you can't say 200 days a year. There's only five, well, five months in the winter. I was on the road quite a bit. Especially when I was in the 70s, when I was following the European freestyle circuit. I was gone every weekend. Did it ever get old living out of a suitcase? I was young. Yeah. I was young. It was fun. I was always with the great Europeans. That's when I really started learning French well with a couple of girls that I was, I was dating at the time. French girls. You know, English wasn't hugely spoken back then. The Germans all spoke English. Some of the Italians spoke English. And, of course, I was learning French, so it was always a mix. Right. And they're always smarter than us and know, like, ten languages. And I'll say us as Americans, even though you're not yeah. American. But, yeah, we don't know anything. I'm a North here. American. Yeah, you're a North American. You have more education up in Canada than we have down here, I'm pretty sure. With all of the technology that is going on with cameras we talked about, that makes shooting and everything easy. And you've seen the industry go from having tons of magazines to having a few. I mean, Powder Magazine was what made you famous. Powder Magazine does not exist anymore. It's really sad and it's terrible. It's terrible. And we see print. It's kind of dying a slow death, in my opinion. I'll talk to other people who say print's not dying a slow death. It's changing. But in your opinion, being that you've lived in the print world for as long as it's mattered in skiing, what is going on? I mean, are we seeing print die a slow death, and is it going to be gone soon? Well, it's, it's social media is, is sort of taking over. For sure. You know, of a Facebook, Instagram, and you know, the, the rest of it. Paper magazines is, yeah, I would, I would assume would, they're expensive to run, whereas social media isn't really. This podcast is, is not going to go into print. It's social media. But I look at the difference between this podcast and an interview that would go in print. 
is that if you had an interview in print, they would get 5% of everything that you and I are talking about right now. Yes. They're going to have an hour and a half of, of hearing you get mad at me, hearing you not get mad at me, <laughs> hearing you talk about different shit. You know what? And that's great because we get a lot more of your story and get to know you a little bit better. So the industry has definitely changed. There are some people that think there still is a place for print. I think there's a place for good print, but it's so few and far between. And I feel like good print has to have increased font size for people like yourself and me to be able to read it because we are the people that would buy print. And right now it's hard for me to read, but that's a totally different place that I'm going to go right now. I'm going to ask my final question and I'm either going to get a smile or just a, a grumpy face from you when I ask it is it seems like you don't really have a filter between your brain and your mouth. And you always say exactly what you think for better or worse. It doesn't matter. But has that ever gotten you in trouble? Just the, this is how it is. This is what I think. And you have to deal with that. Well, I've never got beaten up over it, but yes, yes. Uh, according to John, I don't have that many filters when I speak. I, I say what I think and you know, that's how I am. And I think if more people did it, it might be a better world you know, to call people out. Yeah, I agree with you there, and I do think there is some value. Yeah, there's an asshole born every 30 seconds, and they don't get called out, so they remain assholes. Yeah, that's totally true. At this point, we have gone through our podcast. We've talked about just a fraction of your life and times because you've done so much over the past 50 years of being in this whole industry. But I have Stanley Larson, an incredible friend of yours, an incredible ski athlete who brought freestyle skiing and the hot dog movement to the masses back in the 70s when he was traveling with brands like Marlboro and whatever liquor brand that they were feeding him at the time and all the drugs that were going in his system. And Stanley was having an amazing time. And I love Stanley Larson. Stanley put together three inappropriate questions and he is going to read them to you. He's going to read one to you right now. You're going to answer it. Then we'll go back to Stanley. He'll ask another Stanley, come out over to my mic, ask a question. It's going to be so much fun, Stanley. <laughs> a few years ago, the big change at K2 happened. I love this. Let's split the office up, and Marco comes to town. It's pre-COVID. He comes, and, you know, we're going to go down and say hi. And we had a half hour, so it was great you know, time. It was wonderful. And got into the the display room there and we're looking at the new skis and the new corporate vice or vice president or president guy goes, well, what do you think? Can you remember what skis they were? What what models? Three years ago. It was a mind bender was? Yeah. Yeah, mind, okay. Yeah. And he says, well, what do you think? And what was your answer? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. My answer was I'm I'm skiing on a on a Mindbender 99, 177 long, and it's gray, and it's boring. I said, why? You know, look at your 88, your 90, and your your 106. They're they're beautiful, but your 99, you know, it's boring. Well, you know, I believe critique with the manufacturer is important. But I could also see that being like. He's looking at his skis, and it's like, he just told me my baby's ugly. <laughs> Which is fine. Yeah, but you can't change your, the look of your baby. I'm like going for the door. He's going, these things just look terrible. Are you, <laughs> they can't photograph. I'm a photographer, and uh, the color of skis is, is important. You see them. If somebody flying through the air and the bottoms are showing, and you can, you can really you know, read the logo nice or the top of the skis you can read the logo nice but that the 99 you couldn't see it it was like a shadow flying through the air anyhow that's all changed well there's something to be said for sharing your opinion and you've always done it i believe critique is important it is like i helped berghaus the clothing manufacturer they always had those horrible skin tight pants and powderhorn came out with straight line pants which were comfortable and a bit loose and I showed them to Berghaus, and they got on that bandwagon right smart, okay? And their clothing made advances. I said, why do you make lined coats? Why don't you make a two-layer, a shell with a polar fleece or, or a lining inside? And they got on that bandwagon pretty quick. You know, Berghaus is an English company. Okay. Things like this. When you work as a photographer in the industry, you see things, okay, which, which can change clothing or the cosmetics of a ski to make it more interesting. So that's why I said that. 
I don't remember the person's name at K2, whether he got bent out of shape or not for what I said. Did he? He was speechless, so let's just leave it at that. <laughs> okay, well, there, there's the filter, or non-filter. Well, that's beautiful. Let's go with question number two. You're in Verbier. You become known in the community. You're still a ski bum. And you're starting to break the Swiss rules of residency. Yes. What happened then? The director of Televerbier, his name was Adrian Morand. His, I'm not sure what the relation, whether he was a cousin or a brother of the local policeman, Corporal Morand, they got together and said, this guy's got to stay. So the policeman came to me and we had a coffee. I think in the Fair Chevelle or La Luge at the time, he said, we got to get your paperwork sorted out. So I said, okay. So he takes me down to see the chief of police down in Le Chab, which is uh, the main village near Verbier. And he says, okay. I had a couple of uh, folders with me with pictures printed. And they send me off to the agency in Sion, which is the capital of the state that I live in, to see the person in- involved with uh, foreigners working work permits. They said okay, and I got my first yearly permit, which was a B permit, which led to a C permit. And now all because of that, the people of Verbier, the Banyards, I have a passport. So I'm naturalized Swiss. Hey, uh, talking about the K2 moment, before, you know, working with OTA and making money. No, it was one picture for OTA. Okay. And you're helping Barrymore, and as a... Thank you. He gives you a brand new pair of skis. Should we really go into that? It's an inappropriate question. I feel like if that's your answer, yes. I was helping in Verbier, and he gives me a pair of 1 meter 60 K2 244s, I think they were. I couldn't believe it. It gives me a pair of free skis just for helping out. This is fabulous. So I, I mounted him up with a pair of, uh, of, of 555 Solomons, went up to the top of mountain. I did one helicopter off a bump and blew them apart. <laughs> Never even got to ski on them. Oh. <laughs> they, they, they came apart. Just like de and exploded? Yeah, they just pretty much just exploded. Yeah. Five-second one. A yeah, five-second five pair of skis. I couldn't believe it. I don't know if you want to print that or not. No, no, we're going to print all of this. So that is Inappropriate Questions, and that is our podcast. And as planned, we are going to head to a bar and meet with some guys that you've worked with for the past 30 years probably, right? Yeah, more more than 30 years. It's going to be awesome because you're only in town for a couple days, and you're going to Priest Lake, and you're going to go see Ace Cavalli, and he's your mentor. And the beauty of what you did for people was you took Ace under your wing, you bought Ace a camera, you would send Ace out on the road and you'd give him the jobs that you didn't want and you'd say, hey Ace, you're gonna get two girls, have them stand here, you're gonna stand 10 meters away, have the camera focused like this and you'd tell them exactly what to do. Ace would get the shot, you guys would get paid, he would eventually, you know, I don't know if he gave you a little bit or whatever, but you helped build Ace's career and he's forever indebted to you. Ace kept what he earned. Well, Ace kept what he earned and he's forever indebted to you because you helped build a career and you guys are gonna see each other next week. But regardless, when we look at ski photography and action sports photography and just the way that people use light to draw our eyes in and blow our minds with photographs, because that's all you had back then was photographs to sell locations. You were the guy that figured it out pretty much before anybody else, except for the people on the race course. And you figured out how to get those shots that captivated minds and made people want to spend all their money to travel to these locations. You made an incredible career out of it. You moved. You didn't tell your parents you weren't coming back, and you never came back. You still haven't been back. I'm sure you visited a lot, but like you've lived away for 50 years, which is crazy. And it's a tribute to, I guess, your independence and the fact that you could just go somewhere and start a career from scratch where no one believes in the kid that said, oh, I'm going to be a photographer. But you became the most famous photographer in skiing for 30 years. I mean, nowadays, you know, the kids might not know, but hopefully they're going to hear this and they're going to realize and then they're going to see your pictures. And you created the inspiration for a lot of photographers out there who have it a lot easier than you now. So thank you for your time. Thank you for the compliments. So that was time with Marco Shapiro. And boy, that was a test. It was like everything I said was wrong, but then we would circle back and my research proved to be true. My guess is that Marco has done so many things, met so many people, and smoked enough ganja, even though you wouldn't know it, 
that some of the details that have happened in his life and times are lost. What was really lost was our minds later on that evening. We connected with former K2 CEO and current Mervin Manufacturing CEO Anthony DiRocco. Also, former K2 CEO Tim Patrick was there with his wife Michelle. Ryan Schmees and Ben Wallace joined, and we had a ton of beers at Prost. I was overserved, and it was amazing. It was so good to connect with these legendary players in the game. That's the podcast for this week. At this point, I want to thank you for listening and ask you if you have any questions or concerns. Please send me an email to mike at thepowermovement.com and I will get back to you. Finally, I need to call out the brands that make the show happen and I hope that you support them. They are Rollerblade, Elon Skis, Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and the 10 Barrel Brewery. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>